New York City, 2110. It's been a while since the fall of the U.S. Empire, and by extension, the general decline of much of the world. The massive influence of U.S. economic policy, along with the corresponding materialistic, inefficient, and wasteful values born out of the consumption-based growth economy, began to reach its physical limits in the mid-21st century. Until that point, the race towards global industrialization continued unabated, with the world still pining for the so-called American dream, not computing that if the entire world acted with the same waste patterns as the US, we would have needed four more Earths worth of resources just to keep it all going. What happened? Well, there were three nails in the coffin of societal collapse. The synergy of these issues compounded each other into a vicious storm. And by the time the Earth hit a population of 8 billion, right before the Third World War, global unemployment reached levels of 65%, every government on Earth was bankrupt to each other, and the core hydrocarbon energy sources saw destabilizing scarcity. And while China did win the war, what resolution was achieved didn't last long. The cancer and health epidemics alone in Asia and beyond rose to catastrophic proportions, with a third of the planet still uninhabitable today due to industrial pollution. Today, the global population has fallen by 40% due to scarcity and disease. As far as the energy crisis, the early 21st century made tremendous progress in understanding renewable, sustainable energy systems. We were learning on paper how to stop our use of inherently scarce, polluting energy stores in the earth, realizing the almost unlimited abundance of our regenerative universe, and energy income that could provide for everyone many times over if we only moved fast enough to create the proper infrastructure. Unfortunately, such a transition attempt was met with great resistance by financial interests. You see, there was this thing called the free market, which was far from free, in truth. It was a war and elitist protection system, and the bigger and more profitable an industry became, the less financial incentive existed to alter it. Money was the goal of this game, not sustainability or efficiency. And the fact was, we needed to move fast, utilizing the remaining hydrocarbon resources to create new sustainable energy infrastructure. It was a race against global population increases and hence needs. And sadly, we failed. Passing the point of no return, as once the true scarcity of our hydrocarbon resources became understood, social destabilization and panic rapidly commenced to further barricade. And what little progress did take place was rapidly destroyed thereafter by the water and energy wars. At the same time, the world faced the largest unemployment rates in history. Long considered a Luddite myth, the exponential increase in machine automation in the 21st century created a powerful acceleration of industrial productivity at ever cheaper rates, displacing workers more rapidly than technology could actually create new jobs. Forward thinkers saw a great shift in the architecture of society. Perhaps the ancient idea of earning a living could be replaced with living a life. We could see the new capacity to create an abundance to meet the needs of every human being on Earth, 8 billion and beyond. But sadly, this prospect met the same fate as our energy ambitions. The corporations, locked into a manner of thought which viewed mechanization as not a means for abundance, but rather a means to save even more money in the process of production, set up a violent clash. Not only a clash between workers and owners, but, ironically, a clash of system functions. For capitalism was faced with its most grand contradiction, where suddenly labor could exist with increasingly less human involvement, and hence the constant pursuit of cost efficiency for profit inevitably meant that less money would be put into circulation through wages. And so the system ran itself down into an ever-weakening slump. Noticing this, the cry of some was to stop mechanization, knowing the economy literally needed jobs by design. Others performed activism to try and convince the world that it was time to adapt, to simply give humanity what it needed, to bypass the market. Why should we invent more jobs to waste human life just to keep this system going? Yet, of course, they were bashed in the media, dismissed as socialist upstarts and freedom-hating communists, trying to corrupt the supposed liberty 
of what was nothing more than a religion, the all-seeing market. And by the time the corporate-controlled governments couldn't look the other way any longer, the momentum of anger and dismay was too much. The unions went on strike, and the cry for revolution exploded. The Luddites blamed technology for the problems. The businesses blamed government interference. The counterculture blamed idealized conspiracies, with few realizing that it was a system failure, a natural evolution of our culture which demanded respect and adaptation. And the third, and perhaps most absurd of all social plagues, was the illusion of financial debt. It's an interesting historical note that for some reason, the mafia-style, organized crime mode of the market was never really accepted as a legitimate consequence, when it was, in fact, a ruling ethos inherent in the competitive, scarcity-driven nature of the system. Centuries of denial can be found in the endless economic textbooks of this now failed model, saying that if any such behavior did occur, it was an anomaly, a corruption rather than a core characteristic expected of the system itself. Within this propensity, a debt system emerged. Whether structurally intended as a force of class warfare or not, the system served the elite quite well for a little while. Every form of currency produced was created out of debt and loaned at interest to the governments, businesses, and individuals. Yet, it was a mathematical impossibility for this debt to ever be repaid, as there was always more debt in the global economy than money to pay it back due to the profit mechanism of interest being charged. And while this allowed for a surplus of cheap labor that further divided the classes, moving from 1% owning 40% of the planet's wealth in the early 21st century to now 1% owning 70%, the viral nature of the mechanism got the best of everyone in the end. To expand the delusion, global banking institutions were then installed to loan money made out of debt again to the now bankrupt countries, only to watch these world banks fail over time as well. It was the greatest inadvertent scam of all time, a pyramid scheme on steroids, destined to fail for all. And by the time of World War III, all the countries had defaulted to each other, and the global banking system collapsed. Of course, during these trials, the illusion of so-called democracy still persisted, Equally as religious and mythological in its understanding as the so-called free market, everyone turned to their representative government, a mafia constituency to be sure, intimately in bed with the corporate financial interests, which, by virtue of the ruling ethic of social and class warfare and competition, had little structural incentive to care about the vast majority of the world. And so it went. Not too pretty, huh? Well, while this future may be a little extreme in its presentation, keep in mind this is what the trends suggest. However, I think it's time we take a positive view of the future, one that's actually quite possible if we were intelligent enough to adjust accordingly.